Okay, so um, so we'll be talking about spirit and truth worship, which is opposite of worship of pretense or worship of uh, you know um, something that is distant. So the Lord Jesus uh, says this in Matthew chapter fifteen. Okay, Matthew fifteen verses eight and nine. He's actually quoting from Isaiah. Okay, Matthew fifteen. Right. Okay, you can just follow through in your Bibles. Okay. Um, Verse, verse 8, right? And the Lord says, These people draw near to me with their mouth and honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. And in vain they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. Okay, so he's saying, They draw near to me. Okay, which is a good thing, right? So he's saying, These people draw near to me. Second thing says they honor me. Okay. So both seem to be the right thing. They are drawing near to God. They are honoring God. Seems to be the right thing. Okay. But it goes on to explain. They draw near to me with their mouth, which means they are saying things. They are saying the right things. God, you know, we respect you, we praise you, all that. They are they're drawing near with their mouth. And they honor me with their lips, he says, with the words that they speak. But there's something which is not right. And he's saying their heart is far from me. Okay, Their heart is far from me. Deep within, they're actually far away. Right? Externally, everything seems fine. Externally, if you would observe or if you would hear something, if you would see, it seems fine. Right? Because they are drawing near, they are honoring, they are saying things. What we hear, what we see seems to be fine. But we know that the Lord looks, goes beyond what is on the external, what is on the outside. Right? He goes beyond that. He looks within. He looks into our hearts. So it says here that their heart is far away. Yeah, their heart is far away. They might be close. In terms of drawing near physical posture, etc., but their heart is not in it. Their heart is far away. And so the Greek word used there, sibamai, which means that you know there is a religious worship. It is devout in nature. Uh, it has the right form, it has the right words, it is you know pious and ritualistic and so on, but there is no heart in it. Right? You're disconnected from it. You just do it for the sake of doing it. You do it because it's the norm. That is what is expected. You know, you do it because that's the cultural thing or even the re religious thing to do, right? So, so the Bible talks about uh, avoiding that kind of worship because the Lord says, I see them, but this is what they do, but their heart is far away. And the Lord says in John chapter 4, 23, 24, the verses that we saw that this is what the Father is seeking. Whom, whom is, the, uh, is the father speaking? Whom are the father? You know, what is his heart? Whom is he seeking? He's seeking those who would worship in spirit and in truth. Okay, so he's seeking worshippers who would worship in spirit and truth. Right? Okay. So um, we need to guard ourselves uh, against that kind of a hypocritical worship because the father's heart is really to um, you know go after that. So, so which means that. No, our minds should also be actively involved in worship as much as our heart is, uh, you know, our mind also. Because when we actively think about who God is, when we actively, you know, ponder or meditate on, you know, or, or what He has described, what He has revealed in Scripture, when we actively think about that, right, uh, then our mind is also engaged. We get a revelation, and the Holy Spirit is able to highlight these things to our hearts right but we need to actively keep the word of god uh, in our minds as well right so which means we need to meditate on the word of god joshua 1 verse 8 talks about the fact that we need to meditate on the word of god meditate is to think deeply meditate is to think often meditate is to think frequently right deeply think frequently think over and over again our mind is set on him so it needs to be that kind of a worship. When our mind is not there, then naturally there seems to be a you know, disconnect. Our mind is elsewhere. The Bible talks about a mind that could be described as a carnal mind. We see that in Romans chapter 
8. And it talks about the mind that is focused, but is focused on things of the flesh. It is not focused on the things of the spirit. Right? It is focused, but it's constantly drawn to the things of the flesh, the appetites of the flesh, maybe the ways of the world, the value, what the world values, maybe the mind is all, always set on that. And the Bible warns us, says that such a mind cannot please God, right? Or it, it says, you know, it's interesting how it says it does not have the ability. Okay, when our mind is um, uh, on such things, it does not have the ability to please God. It cannot. Sometimes we wonder, you know, why am I like this? Why is it that I'm not able to go further, deeper? Why is it that, you know, there seems to be a disconnect? Well, we need to check where our mind is. You know, let's look at Romans 8. And um, um, we look at verse 5. Right? Romans 8, verse 5. It says, For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. But those who live according to the Spirit, according to the leading of the Holy Spirit, the things of the Spirit. Verse 6, for to be carnally minded. Okay, that means the mind is on the things of the flesh, right? So for to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God. Right? Listen to the last part nor indeed can be. Okay, So it's not subject to the law of God, nor indeed can be, which means does not have the ability to be subject to the law of God. So no matter how much you try to change your behavior on the outside, well, it always goes back. Why? Because the carnal mind cannot be, does not have the ability to be subject to the laws of God. So then, those, verse 8, those who are in the flesh cannot please God, and so on. Right, so the carnal mind is enemy of God, enmity against God. Everything that God has, it is not subject, which means it is not obedient to God's ways, God's laws. Okay, so here when we talk about worship, and we contrast between a worship that is ignorant, a worship that is where a worship is disconnected. It just has the outward form. We need to check what is the mind focusing on, right? What is the mind full of, right? What are the thoughts that go on? What are we resting on? What are the thoughts that we are constantly thinking about? What is our imagination, right? Is it is something to do with the appetites of the body, which needs to be, you know, which are, uh, are, are the when you things of the flesh, right? again, referring to the appetites of the body, and also with things of the flesh also mean where thoughts are not renewed to the truth of God's word. Okay, So it, it, it talks about all that. Okay, uh, Which verse did we read just now? Okay, we're looking at Romans chapter 8, 5 onwards. right? Romans 8 and verses 5, 5 to all the way to 8. So, so this is something that we need to guard ourselves from, guard ourselves against. So our mind needs to be soaked or focused. Um, there's no question of our mind being switched off when it comes to worshiping God. Right? Our mind is engaged, our spirit is engaged, so our entire being is engaged in our worship of God. So then we come to the question, you know, what happens when we worship God? Is there something that that's happening to man when man worships this infinite, um, you know, God? What happens when we worship him? It could be a personal time of worship. It could be a corporate time of worship. Is there something that that is happening? Right. So we know that worship does not add on to who God already is. You know, just because we keep saying God, you are all powerful, does not make Him all powerful. You know, we say He is all powerful because He is all powerful. You know, when we say God, you are so faithful, doesn't make make Him faithful. Sometimes we think God, God, you are powerful, you are powerful. Uh, we declare that you know, as if to make Him more powerful in the situation. No, He's already powerful, right? And we declare that he is powerful 
and we are coming in alignment with the truth of God. Our doubts are being dismantled. Right? Our unbelief is being you know, taken away. Right? Our mind is being renewed. Right? Our spirit is being edified. So, so the change is not on God's side, because he is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Right? The change happens on our side. Okay? So when we worship God, there is change happening to us. The change that happens to us. Now let's look at um, these scriptures. Right? Uh, Psalm 115, verse 4 and 8. It talks about a person who worships um, the create creation. Okay, Psalm 115, um, verse 4. Okay, Psalm 115, verse 4. Okay, it says, um, okay, verse 3. But our God is in heaven. He does whatever he pleases. Um, and then it talks about, contrast that, that with humanistic or idol worship. Right? It says, their idols are silver and gold, the work of men's hands. They have mouths, but they do not speak. Eyes they have, but they do not see. They have ears, but they do not hear. Noses they have, but they do not smell. They have hands, but they do not handle. Feet they have, but they do not walk. Nor do they mutter through their throat. Verse 8, those who make them are like them. So is everyone who trusts in them. Okay. So an important principle that we see here, right? Um, an important principle, the truth that we see is that whomever we give ourselves to, right? You are surrendering, you are yielding. You are just, you know, making yourself vulnerable to whomever you are surrendering yourselves to. You know, that is worship. We become like them. Right? That's a principle. Because if, if, if in the natural you see, you know, this is how it is. You're giving yourself completely. Your thoughts are like them. Your behavior becomes or your characteristics you take on characteristic of those whom you give yourself to, give yourself over to without reservation, right? So there is a change happening even without you knowing, right? We become like those whom we worship. Psalm 105, 15, verse 5 talks about that, right? Um, let's look at um, Hebrews 12 and verse 29, right? Um, Hebrews 12, 29 talks about God, says, for our God is a consuming fire. In contrast, you know, it talks about the living God, says, our God is a consuming fire. And um, yeah, just one second. Yeah, and uh, verse 2 also, if you look at Hebrews 12 and verse 2, you know, looking unto Jesus, he's the author and the finisher of our faith. Verse 29 says, our God is a consuming fire. Our focus, looking unto Jesus, who's the author and the finisher of our faith. Author meaning he's the originator, right? The one who starts everything. Author and the finisher meaning the one who brings our faith to completion. So our focus is on the Lord Jesus. Our eyes are on the Lord Jesus. Right? Um, you know, this particular inst incident happened, uh, and we see this in the life of Moses. Right? We see this in Exodus chapter 34, um, and um, Moses goes on top of the mountain. The Lord speaks to Moses. Uh, Moses is spending time with God. Uh, he's just alone with God, and he's there for an extended period of time. Right? He's there for 40 days. Right? Then it says, verse 27, Then the Lord said to Moses, Rise the, write these words, for according to the tenor of these words, I have made a covenant with you and with Israel. So he was there with the Lord 40 days and 40 nights. He neither ate bread nor drank water. And he wrote on the tablets the words of the covenant, the Ten Commandments. Now it was so, when Moses came down from Mount Sinai, and the two tablets of the testimony were in Moses' hands when he came down from the mountain, that Moses did not know 
that the skin of his face shone while he talked with him. So when Aaron and the children of Israel saw Moses, behold, the skin of his face shone, and they were afraid to come near him. Right? So which means that physically even there was such a change. Right? His face, because of the glory of God, his face, Moses' face, started glowing. He was in the presence of God. He was interacting with God. He was spending this extended time with God, 40 days. He was fasting. And there was a physical transformation. Right? His face was glowing. And the best part is this. Moses didn't even realize it. Moses didn't even realize the change that was happening to him, the change that has happened to him because of his encounter, because of his time that he spent with the Lord. He didn't even, he wasn't even aware of it. But others saw that change and others noticed it. Okay. Another New Testament scripture which talks about this is in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 17 and 18, right? 2 Corinthians 3. Um, Okay, 2 Corinthians chapter 3, 17 to 18. Um, let's start to read from, let's say, 15, right? Even to this day, when Moses is read, a veil lays on their heart. He's talking about the people, uh, he's talking about the Jews, and um, in the synagogue, when they read the Old Testament scripture, it says there's a veil on their heart. Um, nevertheless, when one turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. Okay, so in turning to the Lord, Whatever was hidden is taken away, and they're able to see the scriptures clearly for what it is. Okay. Um, then, now the Lord is the Spirit. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty, freedom. But we all, with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory just as by the Spirit of the Lord. So it talks about us beholding the glory of God, okay? But with unveiled faces, meaning that, you know, whatever was veiled is taken away when we turn to Jesus. So it's talking about believers who have come to the Lord, who are able to see God for who He is, with unveiled face, beholding the glory of God, right? Glory, we saw who God is and what He does, right? Something that's even so tangible, doxa talks about the glory of God. Kabod talks about the weighty glory of God. He's saying when we behold the glory of God, and we do that in worship, right? When we completely surrender, we do that in worship. We hold, behold the glory of God. It says that we are being transformed, right? Which means radical change, big change. We are being transformed into what? Into the same image, because that's the principle that we see in Psalm 115 as well, we are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as by the Spirit of God. So this is something that happens, right? When we worship the Lord in spirit and truth, when we behold the glory of God, there is change happening to us, which we may not even be aware of, but it's changing. And the thoughts are changing, the desires are changing, the appetites are changing, but we may not even be aware of it right but it's changing because we are yielding ourselves to god we're surrendering ourselves to him in worship so there is transformation that's taking place so it says we are being transformed into the same image which means that we are becoming you know one of the ways by which we become christ-like is when we worship in spirit and truth right? so is worship just a song? Is worship just, you know, singing something before the meeting actually starts? No. It's something powerful. It's something spiritual. Right? There's, there's something transformative that's happening. Right? And um, over and over again, I think even by, you know, personal example, we can see that worship has, whom we worship, of course, you know, the object of worship is always the Lord. Right? We can't just say generally, you know, worship changes us. That is also true, but changes us for the better when we worship the Lord 
who is the truth right and then i remember you know uh, going for one particular meeting this is uh, many years ago and then uh, uh, first of all we were late and so i was very frustrated you know i just you know just taking it out on the family or we i told you guys we are supposed to go we're all wait late and then those days we were going by the bike and then took the bike and going late i'm grumbling mumbling and as we started going it started raining <laughs> so it started raining we are already late and i'm just you know uh, this, um, yeah with all anger and frustration i'm just telling them I mean, you are always like this why do you always you know you're always uh, doing this um, and then i go for the meeting and uh, i'm just going there and you know just worship is happening and i'm not able to you know i'm so i'm not i'm just fighting with god you know i'm all angry inside i'm not able to relate and then the you know the time sharing of the word happened and and it was about you know in the book of philippians right uh, sorry in, the, in in philippi book of acts acts chapter 16 about paul and silas and in the prison and how they sing and when the worship was happening I was actually, you know, saying, God, I can't sing. You know, my emotions are all, you know, jumbled up. I can't sing. I can't worship. How can I be in a mood like this? Then I read it. You know, the first thing that the speaker talks about is Paul and Silas and how they were in prison and how their, you know, backs were bleeding and and how they sang. But at midnight, the verse says, they sang hymns. They were singing to God. And I was really, you know, deeply touched, deeply convicted at right, that moment. And the whole thing changed, right? That encounter, I would say the encounter with the word completely changed my perspective just in an instant. Right? And I was able to just worship the Lord in spirit and in truth. Right? Completely, complete transformation from extreme frustration and you know grumbling, complete change. Right? So that can happen to us. You know, this is just a small thing, but deep rooted change can happen permanent change can happen right very stubborn things that are so deep rooted now having a hold on our lives can be broken things can change when we encounter god in spirit and in truth when we behold the glory of god when we when we choose to you know go back and uh, what happened any questions Okay. Okay. So when we choose to do that, right? When we choose to behold God, and there is change, transformation happening. You know, not just a small change, but the transformation. Okay. So that's so it gives us an understanding of, hey, worship is powerful. Why it's not the process itself, you know, of oh, I'm singing these songs or I'm you know, doing this. No, it's because of whom we worship that change happens. He's so powerful, right? And that change affects us. Okay. Um, look at this. Um, the second thing that we can see, the first thing is transform transforms us, changes us. The second thing is what sets worship apart, right? From maybe uh, you know, just going for a concert or uh, you know listening to any kind of music. You know what sets worship apart is the presence of God. Right. Very important, the presence of God, because in worship we are drawing near to Him. Right? When we draw near to God, James chapter four, verse eight says, "Draw near to God, and He will draw near to you." So when we draw near to God, and when He is drawing near to us, in fact He is with us all the time, but we become aware of the presence of God. Right. We become more and more aware of the presence of God. So that's the thing. You know, that's a that's an amazing thing that the presence of Creator God, the presence of Emmanuel God, the presence of you know whatever you know the names of God that you know that you can think of. You know, Jehovah Jireh, Jehovah Shama. You know, the presence of this God we experience in worship, right? Simply because we have taken that step, intentional step, and saying, you know, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. Psalm 34, verse 1. Or James 4, 8, you know, when we draw near to him, he will draw near to us. So we experience the presence of God, which is again, 
you know, in, which in turn changes us, transforms us, empowers us, right? Encourages us. And that is why, you know, um, our hearts actually become ready to receive the word of God. Now, when we have this time of worship uh, and we gather together and, you know, in church and have the time of worship, our hearts actually become ready to receive God, receive from God, receive the word of God. Heart is prepared to receive more from him. So that's the time of worship. So, um, well, we we have so much happening during worship, and there's so much can happen even in our time of personal worship. You know, just on our own by ourselves in the presence of God, there is so much that can happen. There's so much that God can bring into our lives. There's so much that that can be taken out of our lives. Right? Change happens when things are taken out of our lives. When there is a weeding, when there is a, you know, like a refining that's happening, right? so all that happens. Strength built in, right? Establishing ourselves in the ways of God and faith being built up. All that happens, you know, even in a time of worship, right? Um, okay. The third thing that we see is that worship empowers us to rule and reign. Okay. Worship empowers us to rule and reign. Uh, we come into an agreement with truth. We come into an agreement with our identity of who we are. You know, Revelation chapter five, verse uh, sorry, verse one and verse five says that He has made us. Verse six says He has made us kings and priests to His God and Father. Kings and priests, right? Priests go before God on behalf of people. Uh, go be, go to people on behalf of God, and priests. I'm sorry, priests do that, and kings. Rule and reign, right? So, God in worship, as we draw near to Him, we become more aware of this identity. We come aligned to this identity that God has made us to be kings and priests, priests and kings, right? So, He causes us to rule and reign. This is our identity because we are submitting ourselves to Him in worship. We are yielding ourselves to him in worship. Okay. Um, another important thing that we see in the book of James, James chapter 4, is that uh, James exhorts the believer and he says, Submit yourself then to God and resist the devil and he will flee from you. Okay. Verse 7. Therefore submit to God, resist the devil. Okay. So you see the order. He's saying you submit to God and you resist the devil. Devil. Okay, what is submission? Surrender, yielding, right? B bringing ourselves under the lordship of God. So he's saying, you submit to God, then you resist the devil. So in submission comes authority. In submission, we are actually aligning ourselves to who we are, who he has called us to be, our identity that we have as born again believers. Right? We are coming in agreement with the truth. We are, because we are subject to the truth, we are submitting to the truth, right? So he's saying, submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Okay, so um, we see this um, in operation. So we rule and reign over circumstances, right? There is a revelation of spiritual truth of who God is when we worship. There is a revelation of spiritual truth of who you are, who we are, right? Sometimes we might feel like you know, we are nobody, we are worthless, uh, I don't think we can do anything right, you know, all these kind of thoughts. But worship brings us, when we worship Him in spirit and truth, it brings us to an alignment of who God has called us to be. And then we realize, hey, I'm actually precious to Him. I'm actually of great value to Him. You know, all this revelation floods our minds, and all these thoughts of uselessness, worthlessness, Right? Everything that could be a lie of the enemy just goes off, goes away. And that is why we experience you know, so much of freedom, so much of you know, unburdening that happens in the presence of God when we worship Him. Right? Okay, so worship positions us to rule, positions us to rule and reign. Okay, let's look at a few more uh, verses. Um, um, if you look at Romans 5 and verse 17, it says, "By if by one man's offense 
death reigned through the one much more those who receive abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness will reign in life through the one Jesus Christ now this is the truth right that we were that we, with him with the greater one in us right with the greater one who is in us greater is he who is in us than he that is in the world and with the greater one in us we are being positioned called and positioned to reign in life okay. so what does it mean to reign in life sorry take dominion rise above be in control of right not to lose control of like not to come under circumstances that right? we see you know, even when you know when we in the life of the new testament church and the disciples and, and all the difficult things that we that they went through even in what seemed like utmost defeat and failure right they completely reigned when we studying the book of acts and acts chapter 16 and paul and silas in prison you know nothing could actually break their spirit right they were singing songs to god they experienced that breakthrough paul you know he's taking he's taken as a prisoner to rome and he's on that ship right and everybody's scared because they think that okay this is a life threatening storm this ship is going to capsize and but god has spoken to him but right? he had has an angelic encounter and god has given his word and he is being a source of strength like he is being a source of strength and encouragement like to those in the ship and the captain the commander he's saying you know don't worry nothing will happen our lives will not be you know our lives will not is are not in danger we will be saved yes we there will be damage to the ship and so on right so we are called in whatever circumstances to rise above because we have the greater one in us right so in worship of this greater one in our submission to this greater one right we not only do we come in alignment with the truth but we also put ourselves in a place of walking in authority right and what seems like defeat things turn around we walk in the authority we walk reigning in circumstances about circumstances right and that's what we read accounts like like um uh, in um, you know the, the new testament church again uh, believers being persecuted and being thrown to the lions and you know they face such persecution like especially during the time of the emperor nero right well this is what they happen this is what happened they were thrown and about to be executed but these believers prayed you know ex extra biblical accounts like the historians like josephus and and so on these believers who were facing death you know prayed for those you know these guards and soldiers who were taking them right, taking them to execute them or taking them to you know to throw them to the lions so these these soldiers were prayed for they shared the gospel they prayed for them so you you know you see the situation okay they are in, they are imprisoned they are facing certain death but who's reigning the disciples them they're reigning you know they are totally reigning in the circumstances and they're not coming under the circumstances and so we we see that happening so since we've been positioned to rule and reign in life rise above circumstances when we subject ourselves to god when we yield ourselves to god in worship we are positioning ourselves to rise above circumstances that when we come in agreement with the truth of who god is and in in singing in declaration we are actually rising above the circumstances right and we saw you know the power of uh, praise and we saw that um um so when we when we say okay this is what worship is and this is what worship can do now we also need to look at you know worshiping in difficult circumstances right when things were things like just those circumstances that we talked about you know those kind of uh, incidents and those kind of things happening in worshiping god uh, in difficult circumstances and the classic example that we see is of abraham right abraham said we looked at that verse he said i will go worship and we'll be back he told his servants but inside there was something happening like in his heart because he was supposed to go and 
sacrifice Isaac. Right. So in that one line, he said, "Okay, we'll go worship and we'll come back." But this is what he had. This is what he said. At verse five, Abraham said to the young man, to his young men, "Stay with the donkey. The lad and I will go yonder and worship, and we will come back." Right. Worshiping God in difficult times, in difficult moments. You know, can we do it? Right. Or do we need to have a mood change in our, in order to worship? Right. So, in difficult moments, in life-threatening moments, when we receive bad news, right, can we worship the Lord? Can we keep our eyes on Him, who is the truth? Right? Can we can we say like the psalmist said, "I will bless the Lord at all times." His praise will continually be in my mouth. That's a challenge for us. Right? That's a challenge for all of us. Right? Um, for example, about David, 2 Samuel 12, 19 to 20. It's there in the in the notes. Right? The child dies. The child he has with um, Bathsheba, you know, after all those, um, the, uh, the immorality and all that. It says in verse 20, David arose from the ground. He hears, he hears his no, uh, this news that, yes, the child is dead. He arose from the ground, washed and anointed himself, changed his clothes, went into the house of the Lord, and worshipped. Okay. So he acknowledged. In fact, he says, you know, now he cannot come to where I am, but I will go to where he is. We're talking about the whole thing of death itself. And he's saying he, this is how he did. He went into the house of the Lord, and he worshipped. We read about Paul and Silas, right? And history is full of such instances where people worshipped despite difficulties, right? Um, you know, I, I'm sure you would have heard this song, uh, like um, uh, I think it's "I Surrender All," and is it "I Surrender All"? Um, or uh, I'm just thinking uh, that's the song, or there's one more song. Uh, everybody knows that. Have you heard the song, I Surrender All? All to Jesus, I Surrender, right? Um, and there's another song which, is, which goes by, you know, It Is Well. It Is Well With My Soul. Okay. Um, I forget the name of the songwriter, but the story is like this, you know, it, it is well with my soul. When you, when you go through the words of the song, let me just, um, just pull up the words. Um, Okay, it is well with my soul. Okay. Okay. Oh, uh, Horatio Spamford. Okay. So, it, okay, look, look at this. When peace like a river attends my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot, thou hast taught me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul. And the chorus goes like this it is well, it is well. With my soul, with my soul, it is well, it is well with my soul. And then my sin, oh, the bliss of this glorious thought, my sin, not in part, but the whole, is nailed to the cross. I bear it no more. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, oh, my soul. And then talks about the second coming and um, Lord, uh, our encounter with the God, uh, with the Lord says, and God, haste the day when my faith shall be sight. The days, the clouds be rolled back as a scroll. The trumpet shall sound and the Lord shall descend. Even so, it is well with my soul. So Horatio Spamford, uh, Spafford, sorry, and others have written, uh, others have sung this song um, also. So he wrote this from a place of great tragedy, experiencing great tragedy. Right? So he was he he sent his family. Uh, I think there was three children or uh, his wife. Send this family on a ship, you know, ship journey, not like today's, you know, very, uh, very uncertain, very dangerous, in a storm, uh, and storms can happen, etc. So, so he was supposed to join them. So he sends them and uh, they go. And in the middle of, uh, you know, not, not near the land, but in the middle somewhere, they have, there is this storm and the ship capsizes. His family is drowned. Okay, so his wife is the only one who escapes. Um, the other other children are drowned, right? and he, after some time, he receives the news. Um, 
that this is what it is, that she is the only one who has, who's alive. The rest of the family is drowned. So, and then he goes to join his wife, again, a ship journey. And um, the captain of the ship, you know, calls him and says, okay, this is, this is the place where probably they, the ship capsized, the ship sank. This is the place, according to the map and all that. And then, you know, he starts to write this. He starts to write this. It is well, it is well with my soul. So it's amazing, you know, how can a person who has undergone so much of tragedy, how can he write a song like this? It is well with my soul. Right? And it's, again, the words of that widow, right? So she hears her son has died and the prophet is there and she's going to meet the prophet and he says, it is well. And they ask her, I've just heard this, this is what has happened. And she says, it is well. And she goes to meet the prophet and, and then she encounters and uh, experiences the supernatural hand of God, right? So he writes, it is well with my soul. Okay? So most of these songs, you know, have these, it, it doesn't come from a place of convenience or doesn't come from a place when everything is going fine. These songs are birthed from a place of very difficult circumstances. But they chose to keep their eyes on the Lord. They chose to keep their eyes on the Lord and say, okay, Lord, from you, we know that eternity is not confined to what happens on earth. It is the hereafter, it's beyond that. And you're a God who's beyond this. And if at all, we need to come out of this tragedy, it is by your strength, it is by your peace. In fact, Spafford, Horatio Spafford and his wife, they went on to, I think, start a home for orphans and they went on to establish a lot of work uh, in, um, I forget which nation, but you know they did that, right? So they, they really, the pieces of their life, they picked up and went on to do something good out of it, right? And it, it happened because they kept their eyes on the Lord, right? They could focus and they could even come to a place of worship and write songs like this, which centuries later are a source of inspiration for us. And when we sing this song, it is well with my soul. And there we, we experience the truth of that. Uh, I mean, experience the power of that truth that we are worshiping God with. Right? Power of the truth that we are actually proclaiming, singing out, proclaiming and singing out in song. We experience the comfort, the truth, the power. So literally picked up the, all those broken pieces and restarted all over again. Right? They did that when it's possible because of the Lord, who is the redeemer, who is the restorer. Right. So and, and several songs like this, right? I'm sure you've heard of uh, Fanny Crosby. Right, Fanny Crosby. Um, have you heard songs like "Blessed Assurance," "Jesus Is Mine"? Right, she wrote that song, okay. and she actually became blind. She became blind, I think, uh, maybe when she was two months old, or progressively becoming blind because of some wrong medication, something that they did. And guess how many songs she wrote? Any guess how many songs she would have written? Hymns. 500, anyone decide? 1,500, 500 to 1,500, wow. <laughs> she wrote 8,000 songs in her lifetime, 8,000 songs, okay? And um, and she was a prolific poet, she was a songwriter, nothing could put her down. Now she's blind, okay? So which means this is the days before Braille, right? So we don't, I really don't know how she taught us, how she taught herself to, or how she was taught to read and, you know, uh, about the language and everything, but she was this. And that song, Blessed Assurance, she was actually sitting, visiting a friend, and visiting a friend who was a musician who could play the piano, and she played a tune and said, Fanny, what do you think this tune says? You know, she played it on the piano. And Fanny said, I think this song says, Blessed Assurance, Jesus is mine. Okay. And then she went on to write the rest of the song, and I think they completed it over a period of time. And and it's a you know it's a song of hope, it's a song of encouragement. 
right? But it's coming from a person who could not physically see, right? And um, somebody asked the question, you know, Fanny, don't you feel depressed and, you know, um, that you can't see and, you know, uh, don't you feel down? So this Fanny had this to say. He said, you know, when I think about this, this is what comes to my mind. The first person I'm going to see is Jesus. He said, first person I'm going to see is Jesus. So am I discouraged? No, I'm not. And she came out with so many songs which are an encouragement to the church, to the body of believers. Right? Just imagine, blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Just think of that one line itself. Now, this is my, and the chorus goes like this. This is my story. This is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. Right? So when you think of those words, we think of, we think of comfort. Maybe that person is having a great day, great time. And you know, it comes from a place of pain. Yes, it comes from a deeper place of comfort in the Lord. Right. I remember going, um, uh, I'll just close with this, you know, is going on an electric train, and this is in Chennai, summer, peak summer. I'm doing a project, right? I'm doing this management course, I'm I'm there to do it, and I'm just grumbling, right? God, what weather, what people, an electric train, you know, everybody's like crowded, and uh, I'm wearing this, uh, I'm I'm supposed to wear formal, so I'm wearing the shirt and tie, and you know, I'm carrying my bag, and I'm just complaining, like. Everybody's sweating. I'm always sweating, you know, peak summer. So, and I hear this song, somebody's singing, right? So, this is a person who's begging, who's walked into the electric train and singing at the top of her voice, right? Um, this is a song in Tamil. It's like Muggle Wom, Muggle Wom, right? It's a song which means let's, let's, let's be joyful, let's be joyful, right? And it talks about Jesus. It says, you know, the, the ruler of heaven and earth, you know, he, he, is, he owns me. Right? Uh, he, he is living in me, so let's all rejoice. She's, so I'm, you know, that itself hit me first, the song itself, right? I'm, because I'm grumbling, I'm saying what weather, what people, what discomfort. So she, then I turned around to look at her. She was singing so joyfully, and I could see, I saw that she was blind. She was singing so joyfully. And she's saying, let's rejoice, let's rejoice. And I turned and looked at her and she could not see. She's, you know. And I don't think that song came out because she was begging and wanted some attention. You know, people sing, right? All kinds of songs, you know, popular songs, popular, you know, film music and cine songs and all that to get the attention. But this was really coming from her heart, I felt. And it really pierced my heart. And I'm saying, God, you know, I've got so much in life. I'm, and I'm, you know, I'm going to this, I'm doing this project and everything. And, and here is this person who's singing out, you know, let's rejoice, let's rejoice for the Lord Jesus has our life together. He, you know, he owns us, right? So I was really you know, repentant, you know, really put to shame. But I just want to share this to say that, you know, we can worship the Lord in difficult circumstances. And the Lord considers that as something that is very precious. And not only that, but it can be a blessing to so many others. Right? Okay, so we'll stop here. And then we'll um, continue next class. Thank you so much. God bless.